So hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Sharon Devereaux, and on behalf of Evelyn Battinelli, who's the director of the museum and the board of directors, I want to welcome you to the Somerville Museum for our event, Inside Market Basket, a commercial anchor of Union Square. Um, this event is part of a series of events about Union Square that we're doing during this exhibit, which is called Union Square at Work. And Union Square at Work is a collection of photographs, stories, and music from Somerville's oldest commercial district. And I actually got the idea to do the exhibit from shopping at Market Basket. And I live in Union Square, and as a lot of you know, when you shop at Market Basket, you see people's name tags with the number of years they've worked at the square. And sort of thinking about that and watching shoppers talk with the employees that they'd obviously known for a long time, it got me thinking more about, you know, kind of the meaning of local business. And so it felt important that during the exhibit to have um, an event uh, that explored that idea a little more. So the way the evening is going to go tonight is first I'm going to read a series of quotes from businesses in Union Square that talk about what the market basket brings to the square. And then I'm going to um, have a short essay about shopping in Union Square that was published on Boston.com. And then we're going to hear a poem from poet Somerville poet Karen Miller. And then um, Mimi Graney is going to interview Joe Amaral, who's the store manager of the Union Square Market Basket. And then we're going to give away a gift bag, and then we're going to enjoy some pizza from Caesars, which is right across the street from, um, from Market Basket, and some cider and some cake. And so we hope you stay for that and chat. Um, and also there's going to be some time um, for questions at one point. So, so um, the location that's now the Market Basket used to be the home of H.P. Welch Trucking, which was established in 1902. H.P. Welch's executive offices and their main terminal was on Somerville Avenue. And in 1978, after H.P. Welch was purchased by a Canadian company, A&P bought the property. And it was A&P that actually first developed it as a grocery store. However, the A&P was only open for a very short time. One account says it was about six months, and then it closed. And then it was vacant for a couple of years, and it was boarded up. And I hear that they sometimes did carnivals in the parking lot, but, it, but the store there wasn't a store. And then Market Basket opened in 1981. So as I said, I'm going to um, tell you some quotes from some, from some local businesses about what Market Basket brings to the square. So this is Caesar's Pizza and Subs, which is across the street. Um, Caesar's Pizza and Subs was started in 1978 by George Trotta, and he moved to the United States from Italy in the late 1950s, and he and his family lived in Winter Hill. And Caesar's still makes pizza with George's original dough recipe, and the restaurant is now operated by George's son, Lou. So Lou says, I remember Market Basket opening up in 1981. We were excited about it bringing new people to the area to generate new business. Foot traffic was a big deal for us. But it took a long time for it to sink in what Market Basket would bring to the area. They grew really fast, and everyone seemed to enjoy them supplying jobs. There was a generation of kids every year there working together, brothers and sisters. All of the guys I hang out with now worked across the, across the street at the Market Basket. We all graduated together from Somerville High, but we didn't start hanging out until after high school. I was working here at Caesars and got to know them from when they'd come in. Now I'm best friends with Joe Amaral's brother, Dave, who also worked at the Market Basket, and I've known Joe for 25 years. And then there's Somervello, which is a little further down on Somerville Avenue. Somervello is a bicycle workshop, and it op was opened by J.T. Hargrove and Thomas Strada in June 2014. And about two-thirds of Somervello's business is tune-ups, so making sure your bicycle equipment is working. And they also customize bikes, and they build wheels. So it turns out that several Market Basket employees who ride their bikes to work bring their bikes to Somervello for tune-ups and repairs. As J.T. Hargrove says, 
One of our good customers comes in at least once a week. We've done a ton of work on his bike. He's a super nice guy. I believe he stocks groceries and has worked at Market Basket for a while. A couple other guys from there bring their bikes too. Also, all the time we have people who come in and drop off their bike with a flat tire and say, I'm just gonna run to the Market Basket real quick <laughs> while we repair the tire. And we say, we'll see you in a half an hour because the store is always busy. And then there's M&S Beauty Supply and Record, which is also on Somerville Avenue. M&S Beauty Supply and Record focuses on beauty supplies and cosmetics, primarily catering to the Haitian community. Owner Mark Sam Dalzon expanded his business to include music production and distribution, and he works with artists from Haiti and Guadeloupe and Martinique. And Dalzon says, Market Basket has been there for a long time. A lot of my people, Haitians, will go shopping there, some from Mattapan and Dorchester, if you can believe that. It's good for my business, too. I've been here since 1988, and Market Basket brings me some customers. But I can say I send them some customers, too. I tell my people to go to Market Basket because the price is right. That is why my wife and my family shop there, too. The price is right, and they have good appreciation, good service. The owner? I'm proud of this guy. He knows how to do business, but he has a good heart too. He respects people. He respects his customers and the people who work for him. And then there's Well Foods Plus, um, which opened on Somerville Avenue about seven years ago. The store sells products from Bangladesh, as well as India, Nepal, and Pakistan. Uh, Nahid Kamal and his family operate the store and Well Food specializes in halal meats, including chicken, beef, goat, duck, and chicken hearts. And Nahid says, in the halal process, Muslims believe that you must pray before you kill the goat or the cow. You must treat the animal well and cut it only in the neck. The animal is sacrificing its life in the name of Allah. So Nahid says, I'm a business next to Market Basket, and of course, we don't want to compete with Market Basket. There's no point. But many people who shop here go to Market Basket first to buy milk and other groceries and then think, I'll just stop in and get some spices from Well Foods. We import many of our products so people can use the same thing they got, to use, got used to using back at home. Also, a lot of Middle Eastern people and Muslim people like having halal foods, so they go to Market Basket and then come here to buy some meat. It's a big help. And finally, I have a quote from Community Cooks. Um, Community Cooks is a nonprofit organization based in Union Square, and it mobilizes more than 780 volunteers to prepare and deliver meals to 35 direct service agencies. And the food that the volunteers make serve 3,500 adults and children each month in Somerville and the surrounding communities. And Community Cooks was actually started 25 years ago right here on this street, Westwood Road. It was started by Lucy Liu and her co-founder, Vicki I. And today, 25 years later, still in Union Square, Vicki serves as Community Cook's board president. And here's what Vicki had to say about the market basket. Food is costly. In recent years, our volunteer cooks have told us so. It can be especially costly to purchase the one thing that everyone needs in a meal, which is protein. Our cooks have said that they're really glad they can come here to the Union Square Market Basket where prices are low. Being able to shop here allows them to deliver the type of food, the quality, and the quantity they know is needed. Just because you're a community cook, it doesn't mean you're wealthy. Many of our cooks have limited income, and shopping at the Market Basket allows them to do this service for other people and be able to afford it. So it enables people's ability to give. Um, Okay, now I just want to read from an essay that was on uh, Boston.com about shopping at the Union Square Market Basket that's a little bit less earnest, perhaps, than the quotes <laughs> that I've said so far. Oh. It's by Steve McCone, and he writes, As of the last census, Somerville is the 17th most densely populated city in the country. In 4.1 square miles live 77,000 people. It seems that 76,000 of them shop at Market Basket. <laughs> and all of them arrive five minutes before I do each week. 
On an otherwise crowded Somerville Avenue, the expanse of the store's property sneaks up on you like some long-fronted southern plantation house tucked between tight three families, smaller shops, and a tiny cemetery that's on the historic register. In my move from more suburban Medford to Somerville, I have taken to thinking of the entire store, conveniently close, absurdly cheap, as the city's version of a neighborly plate of brownies. But rather than arriving at my door with an overzealous knock, the brownies have instead been deemed communal, everyone reaching at the same time. So once a week, my new neighbors and I do something closer to wrestling than to food shopping. There's no thinking while shopping at Market Basket. Everything is muscle memory and fluid motion from the moment you extract your cart from the telescope train near the entrance to the, no, I'm not, I'm leaving, I'm not vying for your spot looks that you give other drivers in order to get out of the parking lot. You do not stop at the pallets of bread and mull over fiber content. Browsing is rude, a point hinted at by an occasional tap at the back of your thighs from the cart behind you, or the man who in a moment of congestion simply moans, move. <laughs> from 10 feet away, you select your loaves and grab them. By the time you flick them into your cart, you are past the plexiglass counter where people get money orders and cigarettes, and you're turning onto the first real aisle, which is unofficially one way. Someone moving against the flow looks almost mutinous, and shoppers obeying the current show these inconsiderate backtrackers less concern than nature shows salmon. If you forget something in the first aisle, the best thing to do is just get it the next time you come to Market Basket. So um, now I'd like to introduce Karen Miller. Um, Karen is a poet who says that she's loved Market Basket since she moved to Somerville over 20 years ago. And her poem about Market Basket was published in the Somerville News in 2012. And also in 2012, she won an honorable mention in the Split This Rock Poetry Contest, which celebrates poems about social justice. Um, her poems about the lives of patients in a state hospital in New York were part of a 2013 exhibit at the Exploratorium Museum in San Francisco. And Karen is also a child and adult psychiatrist who practices in Cambridge. So please help me welcome Karen Miller. Hi. So just a couple of things uh, before I, I read. One is a correction. Uh, when I wrote this poem a few years ago, the widest aisle in the market basket was the Goya aisle. That's no longer true. Um, the other thing is that I've come to feel that I didn't express as much appreciation of the people who work at Market Basket in this poem as I would have wished. Um, in another poem that I won't be reading about Market Basket, I call it a neon cathedral. And as far as I can see, the people who work at Market Basket are the ones holding up that cathedral. So, um, our market. Somerville Ave, Somerville, Massachusetts, USA, Western Hemisphere, the world, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, the mind of God, Sunday. Sing Market Basket, where you always find dignity. More for your grace and desperation dollar. Carts pushed hard in health and beauty crash. Sunday bargains, Sunday dresses, mesh, spangle, hearts, go Red Sox, saris. Sing the dark-eyed children arched off carts, their wild trapezes, hum of Hmong, Italian Hindi. White-shirted father peers through glasses, scolds, his dark eyes tired, shining. Sing the broadest aisle, Goya, beans and rice and mango soda, golden-foiled Maria cookies, sweet crumbs in the dairy aisle where seven heads of cauliflower perched on bags of bulbs of garlic, civic flower of Somerville. Teeter, pitch, and roll, and sorry, bro, and mommy, mommy. 
Sing the checkout line. Stares, absorption, irritation, counting. Blessed are the honest, the forgiving, and the overalled. And sing the many shapes of shoppers wedded by their wish to eat, to leave, to meet hot air, self-locking carts and cabbies, half-dead cars alongside beamers, torsos lean on walkers, strollers, feet flip-flop across the blacktop lot and no one killed. Market basket. <laughs> Always more. Thanks, Karen. All right, we are lucky to have Mimi Graney with us tonight. Mimi will interview Market Basket's manager and help give away the gift bag. So Mimi has lived and worked in Union Square for many years, and she's the former executive director of Somerville, Somerville Community Access Television and the founding executive director of Union Square Main Streets. And she also started, she created the annual Fluff Festival, which celebrates Union Square inven invention and marshmallow fluff. Um, in September, Union Square celebrated the 10th annual Fluff Festival. Today, Mimi is half of Relish Management, which provides consulting for placemaking, food-based, and creative economy initiatives. Please help me welcome Mimi Green. That's like a fireside chat. How you doing? So, Joe Amaral has been part of Market Basket since he was a teen. Uh, he was raised in Union Square. He attended Somerville High School where he played on the baseball and basketball teams, and he was also a captain of one of them. And he also played basketball for St. Joseph's Church. Um, he was a part-time employee, and you also worked in Porter Square's Stephen James House, which some folks might recall. And you sold hot dogs in Fenway Park, which is like right. one of the epic jobs you All can possibly have. All the same have. time, too. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a good workout. So over the years, you've worked in a number of different Market Basket locations before you returned to Union Square Market Basket for a third time to serve as a store manager. Right, that's true. So tell me, what was your first day at Market Basket as an employee? What happened? First day? Yeah, that's, that's a while ago. Let's see, 1982. That's the, let me think back. But uh, well, I started there when I was 16, like, like you said. And, um, Oh, okay. If the mic won't amplify, it's just for the uh, cameras. Oh, okay. I'll try and speak up a little bit. Uh, um, first, when I started there, I was obviously uh, just in high school, just doing the simple chores and things like that. And, and I spent about four or five years there doing all types of odd jobs and learning the business. That was the main thing. Even though you're young, you, you pay attention and you, you find your mentors and you, and you follow them. And then you become, you go, you go full time and then you learn some more things. and you jump around from store to store. I've been back there. It's my third time back in the store, and every time I've come back, I've had different jobs. So I started as a full-time employee, then I was a uh, manager, and then now I'm the store manager. So kind of climbed the ladder. So it was uh, nice to be able to accomplish that. So when you said there were some mentors early on, could you tell us about one of them? Uh, they're currently still working for the. Uh, you know, my, my old store manager, Joe Garen, was, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Joe Garen, he, uh, he hired me, and so I still talk to him, you know, once a month or so, and a few of the other uh, managers that I grew up with, um, I still talk to them, and I looked up to them, and they, they were managers at the time, and I, would be, I was able to uh, ascend to that position, so it was, it was pretty gratifying. So how did they mentor you? You just, you just watch, and you, you observe what they do, and you say, you know, these... These guys are pretty smart. I think I can, if I follow what they do and pay attention, ask some good questions, I think I can, I can, I can do what they do. And that's <laughs> kind of how it worked. And you got a personal relationship with them. Not only they're your boss, you become uh, friends with them and, and they're still friends to this day. Yeah. So what do you think makes Market Basket a special kind of store? Well, th this store is definitely unique. Uh, it really <laughs> is. It's, it's a tight store. and. And you get to know, you get to, it's an intimate setting, and you just get to meet everybody, and you talk to them quite frequently, and 
And uh, I think that closeness that they, because the, we're there every day, you got full-time people, not overnight, you have them here during the day. So every day it's the same, I got 15 people in the grocery department, there's eight people working in the produce, and you know, the six or seven butchers in the meat department, it's the same people. And you get to know the, you know, the, the people who shop two or three times a, a week, a couple times a day sometimes, and you just get to know them. So one of the great things about the Union Square Market Basket is it reflects the international flavor of the neighborhood with so many different kinds of in ingredients and items. So how do you respond to requests and what are some of the strangest things or most unusual things you've been asked to stock? Um, <laughs> to really, uh, most of the unusual things we carry, so I mean, <laughs> go, 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 go look around. Um, it, it just, it's, it's incredible some of the uh, different items that you, you see come rolling in and uh, you look at them, you, I, yeah, I don't honestly know what to do with some of them, to tell you the truth, but um, the, the customer dictates the, 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 the shape of the store and what it ends up turning into. It was basically just full of staple items, cereals, milks, and, and meats and vegetables, and then slowly it evolves into what the people want. It, it was ethnic, it turned ethnic early on. And now it's diversified. It's got into the natural foods and organics and gluten-free. It just keeps on evolving. It evolves on its own because of the customers. The customers tell us what they need, and, and we'll make it happen. So what are some of those ingredients that you're sort of like, we'll put it um, up there, and we, I had to go to move the earth to find it. <laughs> um, geez, you got me on the spot there. but. Um, Vegemite is an item that uh, I heard in the song and men at work. I don't know if you remember that. I have this uh, customer that comes asking me for that. So we could try and round, round that up for him. Um, there's just a, a lot of different brands that, uh, that we haven't heard of. You know, if you go on the internet, I have so many people that take out their phone and just, can you show me where this item is? Can you get me this item? I'm like, I get my phone out. We're trying to <laughs> figure out how to, how to get that in the store, and I'll call the buyer. So it, it, there's no item that we can't attempt to get, but it's sometimes not always successful. So you, the market basket is such a part of Union Square now. We can't imagine life before it. Mm -hmm. um, and as somebody who grew up in the neighborhood mm -hmm. before market basket existed, where did you go for your groceries? I don't know if I paid attention back then. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what my mother did. But we went to Johnny's Food Master. I remember that on Beacon Street. I think that was she. We were living on Houghton Street, which is near Prospect Street in Cambridge, and so she would walk there and back. And that's. I think that was her main spot that she got her groceries from. Yeah, I would say so. So Union Square has changed over the years, and Market Baskets changed with it. What are some of the ways? Over your history, you've seen the, the store change, or ha, has, it, has it kind of stayed the same character? Uh, I think it's pretty much stayed the same. It just, it has, uh, it just added. They, they expanded about 10 or 15 years. I wouldn't say expand. They just kind of knocked a few walls down and, and uh, kind of gave it a little bit of a facelift. That was about it. And a few new fixtures here and there. And, and we... And they continue to update here and there. A lot of things you may not notice, but they uh, replace a lot of old equipment and, as they needed to. But it really hasn't changed a lot, other than adding a few registers. We have uh, there's like three or four more registers. We they purchase these mobile registers that they'll roll out, and probably you've probably seen those that uh, we have to we have to roll out when it gets very busy. But um, it really hasn't changed a lot, other than the items that we carry that, that have changed. You know. So talking about those times when you get very busy, um, everyone has tales of Market Basket before a storm when yeah. people are shopping like it's the apocalypse. Um, as somebody who's in charge, getting ready for that onslaught, how do you prepare? And can you tell us about some of the times, uh, just sort of how crazy it got from your side on the, on the other side? Well, how we prepare is obviously like everybody else. They, you see it coming, and you know what's going to happen. And you got the, you have. We'll keep the radio on upstairs, and just all right, when's this going to hit? And then we'll we'll get our trucks, maybe the an extra truck in that night, and we'll have a big night crew in there. And 
get the place all as stuffed as possible. Bread and, and milk. Everything. Every, and we'll, we'll stack as much room as we can. Mm -hmm. As if you ever go out back, and, you know, you might, you might see how jammed it is. It's just, and then after a storm like that, there won't be much left. So that's how we prepare. We'll fill up the store in the back room, and, uh, and then we'll send everybody home for a night crew in the morning, at 7 in the morning, or, and tell them, get some rest and get back here. We need you here as soon as possible. So that's we do it. It's a, a total team effort. So are, are there some storms that among the staff, everybody's like, oh, we survived that one. Do you remember that? Um, that time. You, you know, it's really odd about the storms that they really don't matter to us because they, we know they're going to happen. They're going to happen. The first sign of the, the weatherman says it's going to snow two inches. It might as well save three feet because the first, <laughs> the first sign of snow, and that's it. You get everybody there, and then there's a period of time, it's about a month and a half or two months, maybe from January to February, where people just, just the snow hits and everyone's in here and it gets a little hectic. But after a while, people just have had enough of it. And it's not as, it's just tape is off, no matter what the snow is. So it's, uh, and the stories are the same. You, you, you see it, we'll, we'll line them up and... Start a little uh, crowd control uh, procedure. I'm sure you've seen it. And uh, we just, it takes about six or eight people. And you need three or four people, all the line cutters. You got to make sure. <laughs> Listen, we're, the line's over there, no, no cutting. And that's kind of the, you know, and I'll tell you one thing. I never, in all the years of doing this, that's when everyone's at their best. Even you know, all the customers, they, may, they might wait in a line that's, um, I don't know, 60 feet, 60 people long, you know, that scale up produce and not on meat. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Not a complaint. I don't, I haven't had, we had a few people maybe leave that don't want to wait, but uh, no hassles whatsoever. That's what, uh, everybody's in it together. So uh, Sharon had mentioned that on the uh, name tags of staff, it says how many years they've been right. with the store. and. The market basket's renowned for having great loyalty among their staff. What do you attribute that to? I, I think we take everybody's input. Uh, the way I, I, I see it, at least the way the stores I've been in that and the way I manage. And uh, no matter what level you're at, we're going to teach you the job and do the job the best you can. And uh, you have something to add, we're all is. Well, you can contribute. and. By the level of how you contribute, we'll move you up the ladder. We'll mm -hmm. give you other jobs, more responsibility. I think people see that that there's an advancement policy and there's a procedure where, you know, if I if they do want to do a job at that store, they can get there. And I think when they do get there, they end up. Ten years have gone by, and they become full time on management, and or they have another job. And they, it, we we're, we're very flexible on the hours, we'll work around people, whatever they need. So I think so people realize how uh, convenient it is, and uh, so they, they, they stay. Yeah. So the recent CEO crisis of Market Basket really highlighted uh, the kind of cultural uh, aspect of, of management. Does that filter down to the individual store managers? Is there a particular approach that you and the other store managers have? I think it's just because we know all the parties involved. We, I don't know if... Other people who work, I've never worked for another company, but I would imagine you don't get to see your CEO and, and talk to him, or you can pick up the phone and call him if you have a question. I can pick up the phone tomorrow morning and call the vice president of the company and ask him a question, and I, and I've, I've do that many, many times. Uh, all, the, all the directors of every department, uh, I, we have first-hand knowledge, they, they know us first on a first-name basis, and. That interaction that's always there with all the store managers. Uh, we have these meetings, and we get to these meetings, and it's like a, almost like a reunion. Everybody knows each other. Everybody's worked with each other at some point, and all the supervisors are there. And it's just that close, tight interaction that they have keeps everybody, you know, filters down to uh, everybody in the stores. I think. So, does that mean sort of even down to the baggers and the floor sweepers at the Union Square? store they can just come up to you and Joe I got this problem absolutely yeah. oh yeah absolutely I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat upstairs with somebody told them to shut the door and and heard whatever situation was on their mind mm -hmm. and, 
make many phone calls for people and try and help them out best we can. So you had one of your first jobs at Mer Was it the first job you had? No, Stephen James was actually the first job I had. <laughs> so you ha have given the first job to many people right. um, and probably have saw your, yourself in those interviews back when you had your first interview. Um, is there a particular thing you look for in those young people that you're hiring, a particular quality that you think makes them the right person to bring into the Market Basket family? And what, uh, do you, what are you looking for? What I'm looking for, uh, I, I, appearance first. I, want to say, I think if somebody's coming in for an interview and they're not prepared or they're not, they don't understand that they're gonna sit down and they're trying to get a job, and they show up with their headphones on or their mm -hmm. pants are hanging off of them and they're, you know, right away, well, well, we'll give them the interview. We'll see if they can make a comeback in the interview. We'll see. But uh, that's the main thing. See how they, uh, how they show up for the interview. And, and then after that, I'll ask them a series of questions and try and get them to talk. Try and be, get, see how personable they are. And, you know, see what they, how they're involved in school, how they're doing, and just a little bit like that. And if they have a nice little conversation back and forth, they, they usually... I, I tell you the truth, it's tough not to get, get hired. If, you, if, you get, if you're sitting down, you, you, you're 95% in. It, it, to, to not get hired is, is difficult. You know, we're hiring, we're, we're going to put most people on. We're going to give them a chance. Even the, even the kid that comes in with his pants half off, we're gonna, <laughs> we'll probably give him a chance. We'll probably give him a chance and we'll see how long he lasts. And the people that, that s stay on, is there a particular trait that you think the best market basket employees have, that the, the ones that kind of, kind of makes up who the, who the family members are? Um, I, I think, I don't know about a trait. I think it's, it all depends on the, the, the people who are, who are their particular manager, whatever style they have and, and how much energy and how much uh, motivation they give. I think if that manager does motivate and, and, and leads by example, you're gonna, you'll get like one out of 20 people that really want to be like that. And then you'll have that, you know, at the checkout area, we might have 200 people between cashiers and baggers. So you might get, you know, eight or 10 people that really, really get it. You know, we'll put them in some good positions and, uh, and, let, and then pass it down to see what they can do to bring up some people and to, to, to be like them. So. That's what, the man, that's what the manager should be doing in each department, trying to motivate and, and, and encourage everyone to do the best they can. Yeah. It comes back to the beginning when you were talking about mentoring. You know, it is. It never people. stops. It really it, it can't stop because, you know, you, you constantly have to train for, for the next, next wave of kids. You, you only have them for two years. You know, if you get them 14 to 15, you have them until 17, they're off to college. Or if they do hang around, they, you know, they... They may try some other venture, another job, or they'll work two jobs. Uh, so you have them for a short period. So you, and if you do a good job with them and, and, and they like what they're doing, then they'll, they'll, they'll stay and they'll, they might make it a career. So I'm going to open this up to the audience if folks have got comments and questions. And I'm going to be going around with the microphone, which is not going to amplify your voice. It's just the um, Lenny from City Cable is capturing tonight so that we can have a record and share tonight with the rest of Somerville. So you, you raised your hand there. I'm going to go ahead. Percentage of, in terms of floor space, what percentage is back, the back storage area versus the, the floor that we're all familiar with? I didn't even think until you mentioned it that, hey, there's a the back. Um, I would say um, it's probably like a, a sixth of the store, it's, it's, if that makes sense. No, it's not much. It's probably, I mean, if I can visualize it for you, it's probably from the middle of the aisles to the back wall of the seals floor. So if you went to the middle of any aisle, look on the back wall. Well, if you went in the back room, that's about the same distance that you have. So there isn't a lot of space. There, there really isn't. That's why we, we have to have so many deliveries uh, per day. We probably have probably five tracted, five full trailers a day, Monday through Saturday. And sometimes on holidays, it'll be up, be up to 10 maybe, could be. Uh, 
After the announcement that Arthur T. was coming back and buying the company, how long did it take to get the store back to full strength and full stocking? I think it depends on which store. Which store? Well, I was in North Andover at the time. Oh, okay. um, it took us a little bit longer. We, uh, I think I was, I was pretty happy. I, I did a good job depleting that store to, to its bare bones, so <laughs> it took us a little time to get it going. But I would say about a month. About a month, and it took a little extra time for produce and meats. Uh, but the grocery and the dairy out came back pretty good. Um, I know from talking to Mike Dunlevy, who was the former store manager um, in Somerville at the time, they bounced back a lot quicker because everything was kind of, the produce markets were close, and, and uh, they got them up running pretty, pretty quick. So uh, I don't know how long it took Mike. I wasn't here, but it took us about a month, six weeks. What strategies were used to help people manage during the time that you were down? Um, well, it wasn't a lot of managing other than uh, just opening the doors and letting people come in. Um, we were uh, fighting two fronts. We were trying to keep everybody working, and uh, but we weren't really want to be. We didn't really want to cooperate with the new regime, so we were turning trucks away trying to keep people positive, trying to keep people busy, um, and then just trying to get everybody, get, getting everybody the, the, the information or the possibilities of what could possibly happen if, uh, if, if, it, if they did lose the company. And so it was just more being upbeat and trying to uh, manage what little we had and just trying to keep busy, really. It wasn't much, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's all, that's all we did for about six or seven weeks. Um, a lot of what you were speaking about was about how Market Basket has stayed the same pretty much for the 30 some odd years that it's been there. What potential changes do you see upcoming over the next few to 10 years with the redevelopment of Union Square? I, I don't know what their, their plans are. I'm you know, privy, privy to that, but I, I, I shouldn't really say that the company hasn't changed in, in the sense they. They have evolved in the sense of bringing in some of the other stores like Chelsea and Rivera and the, all the, the cafes and the kitchens they brought in. It's just not in this store. That just so this store in particular stayed the it stayed pretty pretty similar. But um, what their plans are, I, I I'm not sure what they're going to do with this store. I know they it's one of their favorite stores. They 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 love this store, um, and uh, I, I think they're they're willing to do anything they can to to make it, to keep it updated. And we've added a few things just recently to try and get, get more items in the store. Uh, I'm sure they'd love to open up another location, um, you know, Cambridge or Medford or, or even in some if that was possible. a big empty store waiting for you. <laughs> I, I call Mr. DeMolas, I mean, that's, um, <laughs> he's, uh, I'm sure they're, uh, they have a real a developing, developmental team that they look around and constantly looking for property and and uh, they have three sites open for the next four or five uh, year or two that they have planned and other than that I'm not sure what they have planned after that is the small size of this store uh, like a problem do you think that this is like where they would they be able to expand it in the current location or would you just have to move I think they would it's it's a it's actually a good problem to have in the sense it's very efficient the, the store is extremely efficient it's uh there isn't many a lot of stores out there have uh you go in the stores and there you get lost in them on not not in that store you there is things to buy and things to purchase in every corner of that building and so it gets the bang for its buck out of every square foot that's for sure um i don't know what um what was the second part of that? I'm sorry. Oh, would you, would you need to move or... They would never know? move. Okay. They'll, ne yeah. they'll never, <laughs> they'll never move. That store will never, ever go anywhere. Okay. They may add one somewhere, but that ain't going anywhere. Did the opening of the Chelsea store affect things much? A little bit. At, at the very beginning when they... Uh, I think it's just pure curiosity. People went over there and 
they they try it and they, and, and uh, but they all come back. They come back. They that's too big or. You know, I, I get lost in there. I can't find my family members. Or, you, know, you know, you hear all kinds of stories, and your kids get lost. And, but uh, if people go over there. If they're in the area, sure, people pop in there and, and maybe get a cake or something at the bakery or something. But uh, they always come back. Everyone likes the original store, I think. That's what I've always found. Um, I'm one of the, my mom and I, we lived in this area 52 years. Market Basket was one of her favorite. Then we used to go to the Wuben one, and oh, we yeah. knew the managers. Too, that, sure. The managers, they were from here. They went over there. Right. And she used to tell them what was wrong with this Market Basket <laughs> oh. to come back. <laughs> and yeah, I uh, yeah. no, I mean, she was, you know, and when she saw somebody's uh, shopping carts and all that, she used to say, Oh no, you gotta go to Somerville. They have a better, you know. <laughs> and the manager that knew her from Somerville to Wuben used to say, Now, Lena, you can't do that. You're here. <laughs> and, you know, so, but God well, rest her soul, she's gone. And, but I'm well, still here. I'm sure your mother helped us make this store better because that's, that's, how, that's, how, we, that's how it happens. Yeah, Customers' I mean, inputs and. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, she was, you know, she used to tell, you know, go through the carriages. Yeah. Oh, no, you can't go to. <laughs> so she, she was. I hope you're doing that now. Yes. <laughs> oh, good, good. Keep it going. Keep the tradition going. Well, that brings up, is there any healthy competition among the different locations? Um, I, don't, I don't think we uh, ever really get into that. I think we, we help each other out with, with product like... Uh, Chelsea's like our big brother. If we, uh, we run into trouble with product and all our trucks are in the building, I'll call over there. I go, you have any, I need some of this. And I'll send somebody over there with their, the with their truck. From Wuben, they have a good bakery. Oh, yeah. yeah all no, our I'm bakeries, just... I think, are pretty no. good. <laughs> yeah. have them. Oh, have them bring it down? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll put it in the suggestion box. Yeah. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> no, they do have Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they make beautiful sandwiches. Yeah, why not? I'm still, you know, I'm still back. We don't want to do that because then we'll have to, my friend Lou across the street, we'll have to, we don't want to take any business from, this, from Caesars. We want to keep it, keep everything okay, you know. Well, one question I forgot to ask you. People always ask, do your sales of marshmallow fluff go up in September? They do around here. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, we, we bought, uh, we carry... Three or four different, well, we carry two different size marshmallows and the fluff and a smaller jar. So we, we bought everything. And they told me, watch out, it's kind of, so it was my first year really with it. And they were right, everybody's grabbing fluff. <laughs> I remember, I, you did it. <laughs> I, I personally bought an entire grocery wagon full of mini marshmallows. Yeah. Well, we had them, we had them because we, we, we knew about you, so we bought them. This isn't a question, it's a, um, in the spirit of our wonderful poet, a hymn of praise. Um, I read a few years ago an, an interview, I think it was in the New Yorker, about Whole Foods. And their strategy was to have everything very confusing so that the shopper would come into a store and panic and think, oh, I better get this because I may never see it again. And um, I... I'm so touched by how many different people come into, I live a half a block from the market basket. I am in there many times a week. Um, I think of the new arrivals to greater Boston and how it's such a kindness that the market basket is logical. That, you know, things are on aisles the way they're always going to be, and you're not messing with anybody, trying to get them to feel inadequate and nervous and anxious. Um, that's so kind. Thank you. Well, the, the one thing is, is, it's about keeping it simple, and it, it, it simple works. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And you, you could tell the people, the manager, sometimes they'll say, well, I know, I know, I was going to go to aisles, so and so. Sure, that's, yeah. that's why that's we have our full staff every single day to help, to help everybody out. 
Whenever I go into the store and, and have a question, ask an employee, I've ne every time the person knows exactly where it is, what I'm looking for right. and where yeah. it is. Right. And they're always so pleasant. Just they're well, that's, really that's pleasant. the goal, I mean. I wonder if I, you have any ongoing training program or you know, how, you, how you develop that culture. Well, when you put somebody on, when you do hire somebody and you, and you put them in that depart any department, usually put them with your one or two or three most experienced person, mm -hmm. um, associate, and, and, and lead by example. And, and, and we have them shadow them for X amount of time until we think that person's ready to go. And if he sees that person going out of their way for the customer and, and being helpful and I mean, that's, he has no other way to, to do the job. That's how he's being shown. So we just keep doing that over and over again. And uh, he, that's, I think that's the most important part is that first month of somebody starting is if you don't put them with the right person, don't train him with those basics, then you, know, you could lose them. And, you know, so we want to make sure we constantly are doing that procedure. Well, you're doing a great job. Right. Thank well, you. Thanks. The company does a good job. So I've often wondered, do you have like quizzes for your staff? Because they're always able to know, aisle three, bottom shelf, right hand <laughs> side. Yeah. Is there well, like a training thing to help that? Well, it, I think it's the, the, pro the way the product moves off the shelf and we're, so, we're filling it so frequently and we're all jumping in these aisles so much, you know, you just can't help not to know, you know, you just, you, you, if you stock the tomatoes, Every day, you know where the tomatoes are. If you, you know, you just, and then you'll jump in and do the fruit department. You know where it is because you were there for about a week. So <laughs> you, it just gets ingrained in you. We talked about the crowds that would come in uh, for a storm or something like that. Is there ever a down downtime if a client, <laughs> if a client um, wants to come in and slip in, find a parking place, get in and out? Six is there a all, quieter time? I'm there about quarter to six. If you want to come in and walk around, it's, it's, it's <laughs> totally peaceful. But there must be yeah. ebbs and flows during yeah. the week, during the day. I find Friday night at seven o'clock is usually a good time. Yeah, that's a good time. Uh, Monday nights. Uh, the probably busiest time, uh, Monday nights, Saturday nights can be very busy. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are pretty much the same at night. Uh, Sundays are very busy. You want to get in Sunday early. You know, early any day would be, uh, I would suggest. We'll take two more questions. Evelyn? Joe, I'm probably the longest cut of the... I don't want to say the oldest because I'm not the oldest, <laughs> but I am the longest customer. I go back to 1960 when my husband got a position at Fitchburg State, and I start, there's two stores out there, and I started shopping with Market Basket back then. When you people came to some of them, I was thrilled. And um, I want to know, I don't know if anyone else asked this question, um, how can you give a product that sells in other stores for $5.99, for $2.99, <laughs> the Chevrolet cheese, and then that Bar Harbor uh, uh, clam juice? It's $4 in a specialty store, 99 cents at Market Basket. I can't believe it. When you people went on strike, I wasn't feeding my family. <laughs> Uh, that's a testament to the company. They, they, uh, they, they can, if you want to get on the shelf at a market basket, you, you'll probably do anything. And, and that's what these companies will do. The buyers will sit down with the, uh, their salespeople and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll figure it out. They'll, they'll say, look, at, no, that's not good enough. That's not, that's not good enough. We can guarantee we're going to sell this much. And they probably can't believe it. So they say, okay, we'll give you that price if you can sell that much. And when we do, we're going to keep that price. And that's, they kind of, they made their own bet a little bit. So they, and they just do it over and over again. And if you, bet, if you shop market basket, you know, like you people have for, for many years, you may have seen some of the same things have never changed price. <laughs> never. I mean, 
I think a gallon of market basket water is 50 cents. It was when I first started. I think it was still 50 cents. And that's what it is. It's, uh, they, they'll hold down that margin as tight as they possibly can. Uh, we were at a meeting with uh, Mr. Demoles uh, some time ago and uh, talking about margins. And that's one, that was his main focus was we will not raise the margins on these uh, on, on products to, to pay down this uh, this, this uh, problem they have, and they they refuse to do it, and and they kind of go back to the uh, the companies and say, look, if you want to be in business with us, we'll we're going to sell this much and just stick with us and and keep the people uh, you know keep the prices down and they'll keep coming back and you'll get your money, you'll get your profits. It's just in, you'll get it in volume, you get it a little different, but uh, it'll be there. So I think that, that 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 brings them to the table. I think to answer your question, I think they they, they know where, they know how to get it. Just just keep the price down. Okay, you get the final word. There was a four percent discount a year a year year ago. Did that work? Did that bring in more? It, would it ever well, show up again? I'm just curious. I don't know if it will. I think it absolutely worked. I think. Uh, when we were doing that, I mean, people were amazed. You know, every, you know, every every time you shop, you, you know, you don't need any coupons, you don't need no card, you need, and you're gonna make save eight dollars every day. You know, I mean, every time you're in there, if you buy, you know, if you're doing a full shop, um, you know, it adds up. Uh, you know, we did, we posted signs around the building that you can save, you know, x amount of dollars. You know, and it is amazing. The average customer, how much they spend for the for the air, and if you just times it by four percent, how much you can save? That's quite a bit for uh, you know uh, for a working family that could use that money for other things. So and it did work, and I think people appreciated. I think that led to the loyalty too. I think that really helped out. People say, "Well, you look look what they did for us," and so then you, you certainly helped it out, gave it right back. Is there any question we haven't asked you that you wish we had that you wanted to say? Um, no, I think I think you covered it pretty well. I think. Uh, well, I think that's about it. Right. Honest, we, uh, well, thank you so much right. for joining us, Joe. You were great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.